If you're a small business owner looking to grow or expand your business, check out OnDeck Business Loans. OnDeck offers business loans online from $5,000 to $500,000, and their simple application process only takes 10 minutes. Unlike banks, they'll give you a decision quickly, and funding is as fast as one day. Get a free consultation with an OnDeck loan advisor. Visit OnDeck.com slash podcast. This podcast is part of the C-Suite Radio Network, turning the volume up on business. This podcast is sponsored by Grand Heron International. Through a growing network of credentialed and vetted coaches, Grand Heron International brings you on-demand coaching with Coaching On-Site and the Coaching Assistance Program for Corporations. Whether you are a company committed to investing in your leaders, an individual navigating a complex situation, or a coach searching for a superb network of coaches, visit us at GrandHeronInternational.com. Welcome to the Keep Leading Podcast, a podcast dedicated to promoting leadership development and sharing leadership insights. Here's your host, the Leadership Accelerator, Eddie Turner. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Keep Leading Podcast, the podcast dedicated to leadership development and insights. I'm your host, Eddie Turner, the Leadership Accelerator. I work with leaders to accelerate performance and drive impact through the power of coaching, facilitation, and speaking. On today's episode, we're going to talk about conscious living mastery. We're going to talk about what that is, why it matters, and why as leaders, we want to master this skill. We're going to talk about this with Dr. Patrick Williams. Dr. Patrick Williams is a master certified coach and a board certified coach. He's one of the early pioneers of coaching and is often called the ambassador of life coaching. He's a licensed psychologist and has been in the executive coaching field since 1990 with companies such as Hewlett Packard, IBM, and Kodak. Dr. Pat is a co-founder and past board member of the International Coach Federation, known as ICF. He co-chaired the ICF Regulatory Committee and Ethics Committee. He's the past president of ACTO, the Association of Coach Training Organizations, and an honorary VP of the International Society of Coaching Psychology. Dr. Pat was introduced into the inaugural class of the Circle of Distinction, a global award from the International Coach Federation. He's written multiple articles and has co-authored seven books. His latest book, Getting Naked, Emotional Transparency with the Right Person at the Right Time in the Right Place, is what we will discuss today. Dr. Pat, Welcome to the Keep Leading Podcast. Thank you, Eddie. It's a real pleasure to be here. I am just excited to have you because you and I have a mutual friend. I call him Sir Robert. Robert Stack. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. He kept telling me, Eddie, you're getting really serious into this coaching world. And since that's the case, there's someone you must know. And he kept telling me about Patrick Williams. He said, you got to meet him. He is one of the leaders in the industry. He co-founded ICF. He wrote most of those competencies you're studying. And he said that you and I just had to meet. So he made the introduction and we met digitally. But my, oh my, what a treat it was to finally meet you in person at the Institute of Coaching's Leadership Retreat in Boston. Yes, that was. That was pretty special. Yes, it was. So... Now we want to talk about this concept of conscious living mastery and how that relates to the title of your book. Your title, Getting Naked, is actually quite provocative. (laughs) (laughs) 
Tell us the meaning and the message of that, please. Well, you know, it's about being honest and being real. And, and I guess telling that, let me, let me go back to something you just said. I was one of the founding members of the ICF, but I wasn't the person who wrote the competencies. We had a language committee back then. There were many of us that wrote what they still are today. And I was part of that early process. So in the spirit of being nakedly truth, truthful right now, I wanted to say that. <laughs> I appreciate but, that, Ben. But what I, what I think this is about, this, the book I wrote on that topic and the new program I have for coaches is really based on my life work. Even why I became a psychologist and why I got into coaching, I think people can live more fully and more completely and beyond mediocrity if they find a certain group of committed listeners, maybe it's only two or three people, where they can really share their truth. You know, we all hide stuff. Things happen to us. Things have happened to us. Some of us had a traumatic upbringing. Some of us did things we're not proud of or ashamed of or we're guilty of. Or we've given up on dreams that we had because maybe we got married, got pregnant, gave up too early. And so this is about having a place to get naked emotionally. And the reason I use that title is because it feels like disrobing yourself in public, <laughs> which is a common theme in dreaming. You know, people often dream of being naked in public. Well, this is what that feels like. So it's not about nudity. It's about personal honesty and sharing, but with careful choosing of when and where and how and with whom you do that. So getting naked and getting real, yes. which means honesty, which means laying bare who we really are without the mask. Right. And I like what you said about being more fully or living more fully, rather, right, and living beyond mediocrity. That's quite intriguing. Yeah, I, I, I just think all of us human beings shouldn't settle. We shouldn't settle for just living an okay life. Now, some people do, but some people are drawn to personal or vocational or relational development, and that's what coaching comes into. It helps you live beyond your okayness. It helps you not just settle. And, and I think getting naked is my metaphor for having a place where you can really share what is it you really want or what is it you gave up on that you want to revisit or what is it that you don't even know what you don't know? <laughs> There's something missing. And Precisely. being able to share that out loud with a committed listener like a coach is where magic happens. Precisely, because that's what I was going to say. Some people may not even realize they are living a life of mediocrity. They may right. not even realize they've, they've settled in. They've gotten comfortable. Right. It seems normal for them. And it's not until a coach or someone else comes into their life and starts to challenge their assumptions, challenge their current state. And to your point, the fact that they even have stopped dreaming. Yeah. Yeah. I think the value of coaching, I mean, you, you mentioned that I was a psychologist since 1980 and I, you know, I, I started doing coaching in 1990 with corporations back then. And <laughs> we'll talk more about that, but that was back in the days when it was remedial coaching. People were sent to coaching to get their act together or else. So it was ex <laughs> executives that were having problems or executives that were adjusting to new things. Or maybe there was a team building thing that went on with the staff and they had to kind of get, you know, get on board. Nowadays, people get coaching for high performance opportunities. How can you get better at what you're doing? How can you move to the next level? But all of that requires a certain level of, I guess I call it emotional vulnerability. You know, there's a lot written today about emotional, courageous vulnerability. There a book, Susan David wrote a book on emotional agility, you got all Bernie Brown's book, uh, the, the recent CEO of Goldman Sachs said he wants his managers to be more transparent. So leadership in today's world has become a place where you need to be more real. You don't need to totally disrobe. You don't need to totally share every truth. But we have to know when and where we have a mask on and why we're wearing it. Does yes. that make sense? I mean, we, we, don't, we don't share ourselves totally nakedly everywhere, but we have to be aware of what we're not revealing. 
Yes, I was going to ask you to give us a little more clarity on that, because for some people, they may feel you must wear a mask in the world we're in, because otherwise, if we expose ourselves too much, yeah, then folks will gobble us up. <laughs> yeah, you do. And, and today, I mean, in coaching, they some people talk about different roles we play or different masks we wear or internal family systems, which person are you being that's in your internal board of directors? But it's like, as long as you know that you're wearing a mask at, let's say, the Christmas party or the board meeting. I mean, you, you just can't be naked everywhere emotionally. And so that's why the metaphor fits for me. Very nice. So you talk about a lot of very interesting things in this book that can help people understand uh, the power of being authentic, being themselves at work, at home, and in relationships, and in life. And in the end, you give a, a series of life skills you believe everyone must know and master. And one of those really stood out to me because of something I'm starting to see in many of my clients. Mm. And that is, I, I often use the emotional intelligence assessment. And one of the aspects of emotional intelligence is this idea of impulse control. Yeah. And so when it comes to impulse control, I will have a client talk to me about the reasons they're struggling and how they can get control of themselves. Yeah. And so in your book, in that list of life skills, the last one you give people is number six. And you say, we must learn the difference between responding versus reacting. Mm. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's something I... I learned in my coach training many years ago, and it just fit what I learned in my psychology training early on. We as human beings are, are programmed to react. You know, we talk about fight, flight, or freeze. They've added freeze nowadays. The fight or flight response, fight, fight, or freeze. We either want to run away, or we want to fight, or we want to just freeze. We don't know what we're doing. In coaching, we help people have a conversation about well, what's stopping you or what do you want or what needs to happen or who do you need to be for this to happen? So responding means you have choices, right? It, when things happen, our immediate human response is to react. But we can react internally. We can have that internal reaction and stop and be mindful for just a few seconds or a few minutes and then think of the various responses we can have to this opportunity, which <laughs> instead of a challenge, I call it an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that helps people make choices rather than be at risk, you're at choice. And that's a big distinction. Very nice. Very nice. And how does this ideal of conscious living mastery fold into this? Well, everybody comes to coaching or to leadership training or to personal development to become more aware. <laughs> I mean, really, you wouldn't, nobody comes to coaching to say, you yeah, know, my life's great. I just wanted to share that with you. Nothing's wrong. You know, mm -hmm. people want something different. They want to have less of something, more of something. They want to stop something or start something. But we in coaching eventually get to who do you need to be for that to happen? And I think this, um, the concept is to be more real um, and in the moment, have a conversation with somebody who's a committed listener that helps you think what you've not thought, say what you've not said, dream out loud with a committed listener so you hear yourself differently and you get that new perspective of what it is you're contemplating or thinking about. Very nice. Now, <laughs> you've been a psychologist, as we talked about, for more than 40 years and a leadership coach. So what are you up to these days? Well, boy, that's, that, that makes me feel old. I consider myself a wise elder rather than an old geezer. But, <laughs> you know, I, I, it's hard to believe that, that I've done all that. But my path has always been about personal development. No matter what I did, psychology, and I, and I was trained in humanistic and transpersonal, so I didn't like embrace Sigmund Freud. I was always about, let's not diagnose you, let's find out how you want your life to be different. Then coaching came about, and that's the avenue that helped me. So what I'm about today, uh, I'm going to turn 70 in March. 
I've, I've written all those books. I've done all the things that I have accolades for, but that's not what's important to me. What's important to me is the, is the, the legacy that I'm leaving now for the coaching profession, my clients, my students, my friends, my colleagues. So what I'm up to is this, a new program that's kind of the culmination of my life's work based on my book, Getting Naked. But there's a new program called Getting Naked with Your Clothes On that's housed under Coaching Living Mastery, which we're you know, having this conversation about. And, and so that, plus having funds, being a grandfather and all that stuff, is what I want. I want people to access my new work so they can use it with their clients, smooth out the rough edges of their own life. Because as coaches, we know we teach and coach what we need to learn. We're, we're coaching people on what we've just overcome or evolved into or whatever. And we're never perfect. You know, we're not realized beings chanting on a mountaintop, but we, we are coaching people on what's next for them. And if we don't know what's next for us, then we're not being very authentic. So what I'm about is this new program to help experienced, and I would even say new coaches, learn to smooth out their rough edges and work through a program that they can then use with their clients, whether it's corporate, leadership, uh, personal development, relationship, whatever you want to call it. It works for everybody. Very nice. So. You've got the book, Getting Naked, Being Emotionally Transparent at the Right Time, the Right Place, and with the Right Person, and you have a new workshop based on the work in the book. Yes. Yeah, it's an online course that people can take, and then there'll be live sessions with me twice a month as well. Outstanding. Thank you, Dr. Pat. We are talking, ladies and gentlemen, to Dr. Patrick Williams, a master certified coach and a board certified coach. And we're talking about his book, Getting Naked, as well as Conscious Living Mastery. We'll talk to Dr. Pat a little bit more right after this. This podcast is sponsored by Eddie Turner, LLC. Organizations who need to accelerate the development of their leaders call Eddie Turner the Leadership Accelerator. Eddie works with leaders to accelerate performance and drive impact. Call Eddie Turner to help your leaders one-on-one as their coach or to inspire them as a group through the power of facilitation or a keynote address. Visit eddieturnerllc.com to learn more. This is Dr. Marcia Reynolds, author of The Discomfort Zone, and you're listening to the Keep Leading Podcast with Eddie Turner. Okay, we're back, everyone. We're talking to Dr. Patrick Williams. We're talking about getting naked and conscious living mastery. Now, one of the things that makes you so special, Dr. Patrick, is uh, not just the fact you're one of the nicest guys I've ever met, (laughs) but also um, I find you very intriguing. I I read some interesting things about you in your book, about some of your early work and the the, just amount of people you've you've impacted even before going into the world of coaching. But being one of the co-founders of ICF, uh, one of the few people, less than 1% of all coaches in the world to be a master certified coach uh, that really puts you in select company. But there's something else about you that I find very intriguing. And that is you are the ambassador of (laughs) life coaching. And I find that intriguing for this reason. When I studied and became uh, a certified coach, um, I had to pick which area I wanted to focus on. And I settled in on executive coaching and later on added leadership coaching. At the time, I thought about life coaching, and I uh, did do life coaching initially, but I kind of would give that away. I would you know, do that for you know, nonprofit organizations or presidents right. and such like that. But one of the things I started to discover also was that life coaching was starting to get a bad reputation. Yeah. There's a lot of programs where a person can run off to a certain city, and you know, two days later, a couple hundred dollars, you are a certified official life coach. So much so has that impacted the industry and the branding and what people consider about a life coach that the International Coach Federation stopped calling the practice life coaching inside the the ICF world and now refer to it as personal development coaching. What is your view 
on life coaching, being its ambassador, and what has unfolded in the industry? Well, you know, first of all, I didn't create that title. Somebody started calling me that because I wrote a book in 2000 called Therapist is Life Coach, Transforming Your Practice. I was a psychologist. I moved to coaching. I got a lot of therapists to add coaching to their business or move to that arena. And I knew it would get a bad rap. I mean, psychology got a bad rap. Look at the shows of Bob Newhart and the guy on Cheers, Kelsey Grammer later did whatever his radio show was. Psychology has always been fun of and life coaching got made fun of too. But when I wrote the books on life coaching, uh, all of which have been bestsellers, I still get royalties today. So I'm thankful to say, I felt, you know, no matter what you call yourself, like parentheses, I would not put life coach on my card if I wanted to get a gig with the federal government or IBM or Hewlett Packard today. But life coaching is what I do. I coach the whole person. I don't just coach what they're having struggles with in their workplace or their, we coach their relationship or their, their parenting with their kids or their health. I mean, it, it, any conversation can take place. So mm -hmm. it's a whole person approach. I happen to like the shift toward personal development coaching. And that's what I would call myself today. If I was renaming myself, I actually call myself transformational coaching. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just about your job. We're not human doings. We're human beings. So I think the term life coaching probably needs to take a seat to the backs of the auditorium. And we need to call it either whole person coaching or transformational coaching or personal development coaching. And then there's, as you know, executive coaching, wellness coaching, health coaching, relationship coaching, on and on and on. Yes. But it's always about our life, whether we call it that or not. Excellent. Thank you for getting that in there. I wanted to get your perspective as one of the vanguards to be able to share that. And yes, the the idea that you were the ambassador is what other people were saying about you, even as I was saying with uh, Sir Robert. Yeah. I, I do wish, I do wish if I had an ambassador, I wish I had an island in the Caribbean where my embassy was. That would be <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, all of coaching has really grown and much uh, of that is due to organizations such as the ICF that have really done a lot to professionalize coaching from what it was considered uh, not a real industry. And to your point earlier in the 90s, I remember working at uh, GE at the time and anytime I heard that someone had a coach, it was almost a thing of shame. Mm. Right, and you kind of whispered it, you know. Yeah, it's got a coach. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, because it you know it was re remediation, but these days it's a badge of honor. Exactly, you know, exactly. People proudly say they're meeting with their coach at two. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know that that was my goal when I was a psychologist. I wish more and more people would see the benefit of going to see a psychologist. But there was something about that, especially for men and for teenagers. Uh, they uh, um, women have never had a problem. It's seventy percent of therapy clients are women. And I think 70 or 60% of coaching clients are women because they do have a general tendency to share more honestly with somebody as mm -hmm. opposed to males and teens generally. Um, I think that's changing. I think there's a meme today about being more honest and real as I talk about, but I will say if, if we were creating a profession today and we wanted to call it psycho therapy. I'm not sure that would sound any better than life coaching. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But to your point, some things, they have a stigma attached to it. Yeah, exactly. And so exactly. people, they shy away from it for those reasons. Right, as if, right. Hey, I don't need help. I'm, right. I can't admit a weakness. Right. You know, the only coach I want is the one on the football field. Right. Right. And so this idea that as corporate athletes, we need a coach. Well, that, I, I love your term corporate athletes because that's the, that's the thing. If you want to play your best in life and work and relationships and health, whatever it is in your whole life, coaching is not a stigma. It's a sign that if you could have done it by yourself, you already would have. <laughs> and nothing in my life worthwhile has been done in a vacuum. It's mm -hmm. all been in some sort of collaboration or co-leading. You know, indeed. 
And I think the other reason why I always use that analogy is the idea that you, even your greatest athletes realize that, well, most do, not all, right, right. <laughs> but most realize that they need a coach to help them see their blind spots. Right. Oh, beautiful. Right? Well said. Yes. Because, you know, there's some athletes that feel they don't need anyone, that they are the the greatest gift to humanity. But there are those <laughs> who I, I think about Michael Jordan and you know, Tiger Woods, folks like that who have their coaches, they work with their coaches, they actually believe in practice and work ethic and, and not this notion that, you know, I, I don't need any of that. And so right. the corporate athlete or the daily person in their life who recognizes that I may be great, but I can even get to a greater level if I had someone to assist me and help me see those blind spots and shore them up. Right. Well said. Thank you. Now, as someone who's got deep roots in this field, you've seen and experienced a lot. What's the the moment or the achievement that you're most proud of as a coach? Well, you know, it's not all the accolades that you listed and stuff. It's not the titles and the awards I've gotten. It's it's not about me. And I think the biggest thing, to tell you the truth, is when I started my nonprofit, Coaching the Global Village, we started doing training in a federal prison as a donation. Mm. And we, I thought I was going to make a video about all the benefits that coaching did for the prisoners and it had great benefits, but the Bureau of Prisons, BOP, wouldn't let us use the material, even though it was all positive. But I have continued to have a relationship with many of the men that I coached in a federal prison and mentor now that they're out as returning citizens. And then I also co-sponsor a program for women getting out of prison. That's the most meaningful for me. I'm glad to work with executives and leaders and all the different people I've got and the students I've trained through my university that I had for a while, my coach training school. But the biggest impact for me is the prisoners who got out and took time to take the training behind prison walls. And frankly, their essays and their test results were better than some of my graduate degree professionals that I've trained over the years. Isn't that I something? told them once, I said, you guys, these essays and these tests and stuff, you really get this material. They go, well, we got nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, they said that laughingly, but it's like, imagine yourself behind prison bars and waiting to get out and make a difference in life and reclaim your life. So that's what I'm most proud of. Yes, I can relate. I did a little bit of that. And there's something to be said for, uh, I used to, there was this phrase that uh, the richest place was the graveyard because of all the un, untapped talent oh, or talent wow. that went unrealized. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I started thinking about that in my work during, in the prisons because so many of these folks either had troublesome circumstances or circumstances that if, if they had have been just a little bit different, what yeah. they could have become. Yes. And then someone like you comes into their life and it makes a difference. Yeah. What role have you seen coaching play in the recidivism of these folks? Well, I wish it could be bigger, but I, I think if we can allow coaching to become a common strategy in prisons, when people get out or return to citizenship, it will make, help them make a difference because they find out who they wanted to be before they made the bad decisions that got them in prison. Mm -hmm. I mean, stuff happens. I, I could have been in prison. You know, I could have been college. I could have been driving home drunk and killed somebody. I could have. There's all kinds of reasons I could have been there where they are. Mm -hmm. So we're all fortunate that if we're if we've never been in that incarceration and the Justice Department. So I think um, there's so much resource for people that have learned their life mistakes and want to make a difference that we can use as an ongoing resource for a better living for lots of people. Excellent. Excellent. So given your history in the field of coaching, given all that you've accomplished, what's next? What's on the horizon? What do you see as the future of coaching? Well, I wish I had a crystal ball, but my, my fantasy is I knew it would become big and I knew it would become bureaucratic. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got lots of coaching institutions and certifications and organizations. I'm a member of many, but that's true of anything that 
strikes a chord with society. What I love about coaching, and I think the ICF is really growing into itself. There was a time when I thought, oh God, they're becoming just money for money for this and money for this and membership for this and certification. I think that what we're coming on is a recognition by the citizenship around the world, because we're global, 180 some countries coaching's in, maybe more, 48,000 members of the ICF. I don't know what it is today but it's a big impact. Mm -hmm. And I think it's got a possibility to create an opportunity for coaching for those who can't otherwise afford it, which is why I created Coaching the Global Village. My big vision was, if coaching is so great for executives, why can't we take the value of the coach approach to those who are underserved, underdelivered, underfed, underhoused, whatever, And there's a little bit of that going on, but I think it could become bigger. And maybe the ICF or the European Coaching Council or the Association of Coaching in Europe or whoever, maybe we need to form a consolidated union that says, we're going to make sure coaching reaches those who can't otherwise afford it because the changes that will happen will affect humanity at a big level, big level. Wonderful. And I think that's what's next. All right. Well, we will see what the future holds. Thank you so much. How would you summarize our conversation today? Well, Eddie, it's a great conversation. Like like I have conversations with my coach. I, I hear myself say things I wouldn't have otherwise said, think new things. But the bottom line for me and why I've created my program and why I'm on here as an interviewee is Coaching right now is a, is a mechanism for people coming to a conversation to find out what it is they don't know, to be comfortable with what it is they don't know, and to ask and to hear, to hear questions that stimulate them to think new thoughts, and to feel new feelings. My work today is all about emotional learning. You mentioned emotional intelligence earlier in the program. Well, if we're going to have emotional intelligence, we ought to know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> we had to learn how to be more emotional appropriately. Um, I, I call emotions energy in motion, emotion. So oh, coaches, wow. coaches need to learn that emotions are a big part of coaching, but you don't need to do personal archaeology like a psychotherapist. You're just, what are you, what are you feeling? What are you experiencing right now? What needs to change? I can see your sensing some things and don't be afraid of it. Emotions will change when the energy is expressed. Wonderful. And on the Keep Leading podcast, we like to give leaders ideas, quotes that they can use to keep leading. Do you have a quote that you can share with our leaders today? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think leadership is an activity, not a position. So whether you're in a position of leadership or not, you need to be in the activity of leadership and encourage those who are around you to be in that. But I think Thomas Edison's quote that I I live by is, there are no failures, only results. So experiment, be curious, try things. Um, That's what it's about. And when your employees come to you or those who are under your supervision as a leader, really embrace them for experimentation. Now, within limits, we all know corporate limit, I mean, real rules and regulations, et cetera. But, but the best things happen when people try new things. Mm-hmm. So encourage those that you work with to also have a stance of leadership because everybody's a leader when they step up to solve a problem. Indeed. There is no failure, only results from Thomas right. Edison. Exactly. Thank you, Dr. Pat. Where can my listeners learn more about you? Well, there's two sites. DrPatWilliams.com is my main website, and we're we're launching right now. Uh, it'll be brand new when you hear this podcast. Is con- ConsciousLivingMastery.com, and that'll be a that program that's available to coaches, therapists, consultants, helping professionals, and those who are on a track of extreme personal development. ConsciousLivingMastery.com and drpatwilliams.com. 
Wonderful. Well, we will be sure to put all that into the show notes so that folks will have easy access and be able to follow you, connect with you and keep up with you and all the great work that you're doing. Thank, Thank you, you for having us to understand what it means to develop conscious living mastery and to get real by getting naked. Thank you for being here on the show. You're very welcome. And thank you for listening. That concludes this episode, everyone. I'm Eddie Turner, the Leadership Accelerator, reminding you that leadership is not about our title or our position. Leadership is an activity. Leadership is action. It's not the case of once a leader, always a leader. It's not a garment we put on and take off. We must be a leader at our core and allow it to emanate in all we do. So whatever you're doing, always keep leading. Thank you for listening to your host, Eddie Turner, on the Keep Leading Podcast. Please remember to subscribe to the Keep Leading Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen. For more information about Eddie Turner's work, please visit eddieturnerllc.com. Thank you for listening to C-Suite Radio, turning the volume up on business. Are you having trouble finding deals that are actually cash flow positive? Don't have time to look? Well, Rent to Retirement offers full turnkey properties that are already renovated, leased, and managed, allowing you to invest with confidence even out of state. So visit renttoretirement.com. That's rent T O retirement.com or call 307-421-4049 that's 307-421-4049 and get started investing in cash flow markets today